All right. Welcome, everybody. Glad to see you guys here. My name is Keontae Herrera, and I'm a member of the CSCU committee, and I will be tonight's moderator. So <clears throat> we are pleased to offer the this session, Handling the Overlap, presented by the CSCU committee. I have a couple quick housekeeping things I want to go over before we get started in our conversation today. So <clears throat> this session is going to be recorded and it's going to be placed on the CSC website and the YouTube page so that you can watch on demand. It'll also be offered on numerous podcast channels. We will welcome your questions at any point of tonight's conversation. We do ask, though, that you use the Q&A function to ask your question. We're all familiar, there is a chat section as well. So for the chat section, you can comment on anything that you would like, but if you have a question, we would really appreciate if you can place that in the Q&A session and we'll look in there and answer or uh, ask those questions to our panelists live. Um, so now let's go ahead and meet our panelists this evening. Um, each panelist is gonna go ahead and share their name where they're working and how long they've currently been there. And then we'll pick up from there. So I'm gonna start with you, Alicia. Hi, I'm Alicia Alexander. I'm the SID Assistant AD at Lewis Clark State College in Idaho. We're in the NAIA and this is my sixth year here. I'm gonna go ahead and pass it over to Kevin. Thanks, Alicia. Uh, my name is Kevin Hashiro. I'm the Sports Information Director here at Chaminade University, a Division II school here in Honolulu, Hawaii. And I'm in my 12th year here. Uh, at Chaminade. I will throw it over to John. John? Thanks. Hi, everybody. My name is John Hartrick, and I work at Binghamton University. I'm Associate uh, AD for Communications uh, in upstate New York, uh, Division I school in the America East Conference, and I am in year 33 at Binghamton. All right. Shout out to 33. Okay. <laughs> so <clears throat> before we really get going into our conversation, I wanted to go ahead and talk about what do we actually mean when we say handling the overlap? Well, overlap, or as some people call it, crossover season, is the hectic part, part of the year where some sports are approaching its end while other sports are starting their season, but we're still in the same semester. There is two major crossover seasons that we face. We have going from the fall to the winter, and then the end of the winter going into the spring. So for today's conversation, we're gonna go ahead and focus on strategies and ideas on how to navigate this difficult time, uh, specifically as it pertains to you as young professionals, graduate assistants, student assistants, and interns. So now with that defined, Kevin, I would like to ask, how do you make sure everything is done and nothing slips through the cracks during the crossover season? Yeah, thanks, Keontae. So uh, what I try to do is be as organized as possible. And I know that we are in the digital age. We put everything on phones and everything like that. But for someone like me, who's a, I'm a little bit more old school. So I have physical calendars. Uh, I have a large uh, uh, dry, dry erase board in front of me. It's a four-month calendar. I put all of our games on that calendar. So not only can I see it, but... Um, if others in our athletic department need to see it, they can they can take a look at it too. Uh, I have a second calendar, which is a uh, basically it's a wall calendar, or if you want, you could use a, a large desk calendar, something like this. And so what I do is I plan all of my functions, events, things that I need to do. I put it on there, um, as opposed to putting it on a digital device because sometimes I don't look at it. If I have it with me, you know, I can see what I need to do. Um, it's also handy to have a notepad, a physical notepad um, that you can write on, uh, put all of your events, and uh, try to uh, put everything that you need to do on the notepad. Now, granted, sometimes some things will fall through the cracks, but I've noticed that uh, by putting it on a notepad and having a, a physical instrument in front of me, I tend to be a little bit more organized. And that's part of uh, how I try to handle the transition from the uh, from the fall slash winter and then winter slash spring. Good deal. What about you, Alicia? What are some things that you do 
to make sure that nothing slips through. Where I'm really similar to Kevin and where I write everything down. I've got a calendar right behind me for the month. I've got a planner that um, I look at all the dates for the year um, and I go through, you know, what when our nominations do for awards, when do certain releases come out, you know, the schedules as far in advance as I can get them. And I write it all down. I color code everything because when you do get into the crossover, you're going to be dealing with end of season awards for one sport and contests and preseason information for another sport. So just being able to have it all laid out in front of me and, you know, easy reference, I'll flip to, you know, January, February and see what's going on. Um, and that way, too, you're able to write down, okay, I need to have my posters done by this date. So it's always in front of you. And again, similar to Kevin, I'm not always going to be looking at my phone because I get enough notifications on that. So if I can avoid looking at that for something, then I'm going to do that. So real quick, I'm going to stick right here with you. Um, you know, obviously, we have the crossover season that we're talking about. Um, and those are two sports that's coming into season. Well, Alicia, how do you balance in-season responsibilities, but still have some out-of-season sports? I think that's a conversation that needs to be had with coaches early on. And I'm really lucky because my coaches understand this. You know, you're looking at the the fall winter crossover. We have volleyball, cross country, and golf in the fall, and basketball and indoor track in the winter. So basketball and track are really good about recognizing okay volleyball is the priority cross country is the priority right now um so they're good about letting that take precedence when it comes to coverage but also knowing that you know these seasons are getting ready to start so you have to also make sure you are on top of it and if you have i say downtime but i know that's not always the case jumping ahead and utilizing if you have an intern if you have a ga um, or just an extra set of hands, getting those schedules in as early as you can. You can always edit them, but getting ahead. I mean, I had the baseball schedule in a couple of weeks ago and we're still, we're in December now, but it's going to be here before you know it because that's our busiest crossover is winter, spring. So just starting to get ahead and communicating with your coaches and making sure they understand we are going to get you your coverage, but this one takes priority, especially when teams go to playoffs. You know, a team that is in the postseason is going to take priority over a team that is doing preseason scrimmages or just getting going with their schedule. Got you. And what about you, John? How, how do you do that balance with in-season responsibilities with out-of-season sports? Yeah, thanks, Kante. I, I would say first, just as a general statement about what we're talking about tonight, most of these strategies, truthfully, uh, about getting through this, the crossover time are appropriate for the whole rest of the year as well. We've all said the same thing, planning ahead, working ahead, not only planning ahead, but working ahead, as Alicia just said, with schedules, getting stuff put in well ahead so that you reduce the the, the stress, the crunch time that you have. And, and anything that involves um, needing input from other people, uh, for me, that's a no brainer to be well ahead of the time because, you know, you don't want other people to slow you down. So if you can get requests out for information, whether it be roster information, schedules from coaches, um, information you need from opponents or colleagues, all those requests that you know might hold you up at some point, um, get those out as soon as possible so that they're not holding you up so that you can keep moving. And then as the responses filter in, you just plug those into where you already are. But you're not stalled initially. You've got to kind of keep yourself moving at a good pace so that you, you're not sitting there with your hands tied waiting for information from someone else. So, um, but generally speaking for me, it's just, again, planning ahead, working ahead, over communicating with the coaches. There's just no such thing as, as too much communication with the coaches. They need to know what you need and the timeline of when you need it. And then for me, over the years, I've just understood that you have to build in time for the coaches to not respond to you the first time and you got to badger them a little bit. And so you understand this little game that if they need something from you, uh, they're pretty prompt with it, but when the roles are reversed, they tend to be a little slow. And so you, you just have to know this and, 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 you know, accept it so that you build in that time so that again, you're not sort of stalled in your own actions. Um, and then ideally you understand also the priorities from from above, from your boss, the AD or whomever, so that you know when you're having these overlaps, you know what the priority is, whether that's a formal tiering of the sports that you have um, so that a swim coach understands where they stand roughly compared to basketball or soccer or wrestling or whatever it happens to be. Um, 
the more the coaches understand where they fit into the structure of, of how you're choosing to do the things that you need to do because you can't accommodate everybody. So at some point, a priority list has to be made. So among your long list of things that you will be doing, and I do the same thing. I write lists for myself, make notes. Usually I do it at night or on bus rides so that by the time the day starts, the next day, I'm just checking off uh, action items that I can finish. Um, but but in order to do that, you need to prioritize. And, and sometimes you'll need help from your boss about what's the fairest way to prioritize because you don't want to be on the hook if two coaches expect something from you and it's just not realistic. You know, John, I'm going to ask you a, a hot question right here. Um, and I, I believe you have the wisdom for it. Um, you mentioned having that conversation uh, with your superiors about what's the priority. When you have the, that conversation and you come away with the verdict, how is that conversation when you have to essentially maybe tell a coach that's on the lower priority at that time, how do you share that information, especially in a way that's still respectful? Well, um, th that is a fair question. Um, and, and I guess a lot of it, honestly, uh, we're in a people business and, and the, the relationship that you've built hopefully is strong initially so that you can be very forward and, and truthful with one another. And I would expect the same feedback from the coach if they didn't think I was doing something up to their standard or, or they disagreed. I would expect to hear it straight. So hopefully you have that comfort level. You've built that over time that um, you can be forthcoming and, and not so much, hey, I've been told that that I should treat you less than this other team. But but you can basically say, usually it is something simple. Hey, you're out of seat. You're two seasons from now. So a spring sport in the fall um, is naturally going to get less, but that doesn't mean they're not touched. And one of the other things I wanted to mention too, for me is I try to touch all the sports that I work with every single day, even if they're out of season. If that means just a quick message to the coach about some ideas that I had or responding to something they had, stopping into a practice, uh, making some connection every day or checking off something. Obviously, if it's the season upcoming, um, there's more to do with the schedule posting and releases, but out of season, the NLIs, uh, facility information, feature stories, usually that's a good um, balancing a topic, I think, with coaches who you're you're kind of having that conversation with that you're going to be getting to them a little bit later in the pecking order is you can toss out some sort of uh, safety net ideas of, of here are a few feature ideas. You know, what do you think of this? We're going to start chipping away at this, it, throwing them a bone, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. But but it's some of it is just really appealing to their uh, their comfort level that you care about them, that you're paying attention to them, that just because there are other sports in between you and them in the moment, it's not always going to be that way. And um, you're keeping up with your knowledge of their sports. So when the time is right, you'll be ready to jump in. And a lot of it is just reassuring them that you care about them. It sounds silly, but coaches tend to be uh, really focused on what they've got going. And sometimes if you're not in, you're out for them. And, and you have to kind of gauge the personality of your coach and find out, all right, how accommodating are they going to be? And if it does get uh, difficult, then, of course, then you really have to be firm and say, this is what I've been told. And you just relay the information. This is where you stand relative to these other sports. But hopefully you, you solve it before that. And again, it's just relationships with people. You find out how they like to be communicated with and treated professionally. And you expect the same yourself. And, and you just work out an agreement because you're both understanding people. Gotcha. And then I, I want to ask you, Kevin, do you have any kind of tips and ideas on, on that same question about the conversation with another team um, about them obviously not saying that they're a lower priority, but, you know, how do you, how, what's your verbiage there? Yeah, I, I will agree um, with what John just said that um, I do have these conversations. Um, it's pretty much with me and my coaches and even my administrators that the priority is usually the ones in season. If we're closing uh, wrapping up a season, uh, let's say uh, if volleyball is going to make the playoffs, uh, then they will have priority over, say, men's basketball, uh, which is just starting because uh, of the uh, of the of that type of, I guess, attention that uh, everyone's paying attention to the playoffs, whereas uh, you have a start of the season. But but yeah, I, I'm like John. I try to have these conversations. Um, with our coaches saying, "Hey, we're not. I'm not going to really. I'm not ignoring you. It's just we've got to prioritize uh, certain sports 
at this juncture. And then uh, when that season is over, then we'll go ahead and we'll give you more full attention, but um, not totally closing the books on you guys um, for one sport. Uh, but we do have priorities that we do make here. Yeah, yeah. I'll just add that, I, you know, we could probably have a separate panel on just managing the coach relationship because, <laughs> and I find it really interesting over the years because um, half the battle is, I mean, we, we think because we're so driven by tasks that we need to get information from them. And, and it's just sort of this constant battle to find out information and then push it out and, and appease the coaches that way. But equally important, in my opinion, is just what I said, which is learning how the coach wants to be managed or wants to be worked with. And, and not only just the basics of how do they like to be communicated with by phone call, email, text, in person, um, but also what makes them tick. What what is going to satisfy them? Some people like again to feel like you're with them. You come down to practice. You're visible. Uh, some people love the social media coaches way more than others. Some coaches love the old school website and and media relations. And so every coach is different, and their personalities are different. Some are prickly. Some are easy to work with. Some are stressed. Some are you name it. But they just want to be reassured that you're handling them and dealing with them the way that they want to be. And it's different for everybody. And so just trying to understand what makes them tick and then try to accommodate them as much as possible. And then of course, as we tend to forget about in our profession, make sure you're treated the same way also and hold them to that standard too. Um, it's it's not a one-way relationship and, and we shouldn't let coaches get soft on the way they treat uh, us in our profession. So, but, but it's really learning how to get the most out of the relationship so that you can avoid many of the conflicts that, that occur. Well, I will say, John, you're absolutely right that this could probably be a whole different, uh, webinar on its own. Um, and before moving on, I do want to address, at least we have a question here in the Q and a, so Alicia, I want to ask you, you know, how do you best temper a coach's expectations, especially as a younger SID? Yeah, when I first started here at LC State, I was 23 years old and it took time to, you know, gain the coach's trust because I was I was young. I'm not from here. I came from SoCal and no one knew who I was. And it took a couple of years to gain that trust. And once we got there, once we got through, you know, some of the tough times and, you know, right in my second year was the, the COVID thing. Um, you know, it, I was able to prove myself and that I knew what I was doing and that things were getting handled. And once we got through that first couple of years, a lot easier. Plus it's getting to know the coaches kind of like what John was talking about. You get to know the coaches and they get to know you, you know, how they best operate, you know, how they best communicate. So being able to figure that out and use it to your advantage, you know, I have our track and field coach is one who likes to talk out his quotes. He doesn't, he's not a texter. He's not big on email. He wants to talk through things. Whereas you know, basketball, he's very specific on what he wants to say. He's going to text you his quote post game because he's very mm -hmm. specific on what he wants in there. Um, and then also I do similar to what John was saying. I go downstairs every day and see who's in their office and just sit and chat. Even if it's just a quick, Hey, I saw, you know, you signed somebody or talking about competitions that are coming up, depending on, you know, who's in season. Um, but it takes time. And then having the support from your higher ups is huge too, just because, you know, if they have your back, it's a lot easier to have a hard conversation with the coach if you know that if they do, they, if they don't like what you say, you have the backup that you need. But yeah. it, it takes time. No, that, that's really good. That's really good. Um, And we're going to move on, but I will say uh, thank you for that question. And remember, continue to use that Q&A uh, uh, function, and we'll definitely get to your question, even if it's on a topic that we've already kind of addressed. We can go back to it towards the end of the webinar. So, John, I wanted to ask, how do you balance now two in-season needs at the same time? Yeah, that's uh, that's very challenging for sure. And I guess in a perfect world, you uh, wouldn't have it. Um, or if you had it, it would be with maybe one prominent sport for us. Let's say in the fall, it would be a team sport, soccer, either soccer or volleyball. Balance that with... Uh, a, a smaller sport in terms of the roster and the competition. So let's say uh, golf or tennis or, or cross country. Um, and the other thing is truthfully, uh, at least in my office, what, what I, since I'm, I'm divvying up the sports myself with my three assistants, um, ideally, again, you, you balance it out. So someone is not 
handling two prominent sports in the same season. And not only that, they're, they're not handling two prominent sports in back-to-back seasons with the crossover. So the crossover becomes a little more manageable if you're going from uh, having the cross country and tennis team in the fall to basketball, let's say in the winter. But if you had um, two sports in the fall, I actually had that. We were short staffed last year. We were hiring both our assistants and, um, and I had soccer, women's soccer and volleyball at the same time. Um, and I think that just forces you to, again, I hate to kind of reiterate the same things again, but, but plan, prioritize your own um, skill sets and your own tasks, uh, and obviously prioritizing the home events that you've got to cover. So that's first and foremost, um, yeah. because there'll be a lot of those to cover. And then certainly handling all the media requests and the requests from your colleagues to send rosters and stats and notes and things. Um, and then just simply putting in the work that needs to be put in. And there's no simple way around that. Unfortunately, you hope it doesn't come to that, but it does. If it does, you just got to make sure you don't miss deadlines for um, all conference things. You got to really be on top of the deadlines for nominations, for releases that are coming out, because that would be the worst thing is if you were caught up in one sport and you missed something major for the other one, or you didn't give yourself enough time to prep for it. Um, But again, just being organized uh, being as polished as you can. We haven't really talked about this yet, but um, a lot of the things about being organized become easier the the more polished you are in your skill set. So if I know I can uh, write a pregame tease for a soccer game or a basketball game in, in 15 minutes, uh, that's that serves me a lot better than if I took a half hour to do it. Um, and same thing, a recap at the end of a, of a competition. The, the faster you can get yourself to do those chores, as I call them, the tasks, then the better served you're going to be in handling the overlap. So some of it is just managing the time, and the rest of it is really kind of polishing your own personal skills too, so that you're able to take on more at the same time. And then the obvious, obvious one, which is just simply to lean on people, lean on your interns and other people for stats and videography and social media, and create your own pecking order in your brain that if something is going to drop off, what could it be? And I always tell people too, in a perfect world, we all would handle this overload of tasks that we have every day. Um, we'd learn how to handle them at 80% of our time and skill set, but it would look like it was 100%. So you try to get that skill so that when someone reads your story, when someone looks at the stats, when someone uh, follows you on social media, it looks like you've poured your guts into it. But in reality, you know, you gave it about 80%, let's say, because if we gave 100% to every task, we'd never get through it, let's be honest. So some of it is just your own polish, and then the rest of it is just being as organized as as possible. And, and what about you, Kevin? Um, you know, how do you balance two in-season needs at the same time? Well, at Shamana, we have a, we're a small school, so we, we only have uh, 10 sports, uh, actually 12 now we've added two spring sports um, I always try to keep in mind too that when you have a feature sport like here at Chaminade our feature sport in the fall would be uh, volleyball and and soccer, men's and women's soccer uh, we also have two uh, smaller sports like cross country men's and women's cross country uh, I, I try to at least put myself in cross country shoes um, they don't get as much attention like soccer and volleyball does. So I, I just try to uh, make sure that I think about what they do. I, I'm a one person shop here at, at, at Chaminade. So uh, I, I try to at least throw them a, a little bit of attention, whether it's uh, uh, going on social media, uh, maybe putting out a, a, a release, uh, especially if it's a big uh, event coming up, such as uh, division two regionals. If we have our home meet, uh, then I'll try to put a, a release out on that and just kind of make them feel inclusive. Uh, it, it is kind of tough uh, with different sports uh, at the same time because you want to give them uh, the equal amount of attention. But like John said, it, it, it's tough, but uh, you try your best to make sure that that all teams in, uh, in a particular season have the same kind of attention. Um, it's going to be interesting for us here at Chaminade in the spring because we just added baseball for the first time in 40 something years. Um, our feature sport this spring was always softball. So it's going to be interesting from my perspective on trying to handle 
a new sport like baseball, which is getting a ton of attention here in in in, uh, in Honolulu, as opposed to softball, which used to have all the attention. So uh, this is going to be, that's going to be new territory for me to to to, to try and uh, uh, balance those two sports in a couple of months uh, when yeah. when those two get underway. Now I'll, I'll say too, if I could, Kante, um, the one of the other things that is going to kind of sound a little self-serving, but we like to have student athletes as interns in the office and primarily on our campus, we don't have a communication major, a journalism major. And so typically our, our best people that know about sports and, and are interested in what we do are athletes. And so in their off seasons, we certainly encourage them to do internships and they can get credit through campus that way. But Selfishly for us, one of the biggest benefits of having them in the office is that they can see, number one, how busy we are, and they can be our advocates back with their teams and their fellow teammates and, and fellow athletes to understand, oh, wow, when they hear a, 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 an athlete squawking about how they don't get covered as much as this other team. And, and a lot of times that's, of course, the routine that we know is the athletes will compare themselves to each other. And so we all know it's unrealistic for a tennis player to expect the same coverage as as a basketball player or a football player but the athletes don't really understand that and so of course we try to in a gentle way explain to them that they really ought to be comparing themselves to a tennis player or cross-country runner at another school and, and sort of see how that coverage looks like because we feel like we stack up pretty well that way but we try to discourage that comparison and the best way to kind of try to plant that seed is to utilize our, our athlete interns and at least let them try to educate their peers about what it's really like working in the office and, and just how hectic it is and how, again, we're, we're trying our best to accommodate everyone. Their time will come, um, but but it, it garners a little more sympathy if you can kind of educate everyone as much as possible. Yeah, no, that's, that's some good wisdom right there. Um, you know, we still have one more layer deep to go into all of this but you know i'm in this with y'all so as i sit here and i think about you know the crossover season and stuff like that like it really can you know be stressful just by thinking about it and actually of course having to do it um alicia how do you take time for yourself so that you don't go crazy when you're dealing with all of this stuff i wouldn't say don't go crazy because it probably still happens but I've learned that you can't take it, you know, you're not able to take large chunks of time. You can't say, you know, I'm going to take a whole day off. It's like, Kevin, I'm a one person shop. We have 13 sports this year. We added a sport this year. Um, plus we have a pretty hefty spring season because we host a lot of postseason baseball. So, you know, a full day off is not always possible, but what I found is, you know, a little goes a long way. You know, I'll take an extra hour at lunch and just be home with my family or, you know, hey, I'm going to take off early one day if I'm able to. Um, we've been lucky. We've had some Saturdays without basketball so far this basketball season due to schedule changes due to playing Thursday, Friday. I don't remember the last time I had, you know, two Saturdays off in mm -hmm. basketball season. So, you know, taking taking advantage when the schedule allows. But really, even if it's just sitting at your desk and taking 20 minutes to turn around, not face your computer, um, and just take a little bit of time for yourself because if you can't always take that big chunk. Um, but you know, take that extra time at lunch. You know, if your school doesn't play on Sundays, sleep all day. Just give whatever relaxes you. I'm I love to sleep all day on Sunday because I don't have to worry about anything until, you know, weekly nominations that night. But just finding little ways to rest my mind and, you know, work as always. I you know I still have SID dreams. It's totally normal. Um, not as bad as the first couple of years, but just being able to steal myself away and focus on something else, whether I'm turning on, you know, bad TV reality shows, <laughs> just, you know, SpongeBob, just mind numbing stuff, just to break away from the craziness that is work for a little bit. No, I mean, that's really important that self care, you know, um, especially for us as the actual um, professionals and covering all of this stuff is really important. And um, I mean, I know it's hard, but, you know, Kevin, do you have anything that, you know, kind of helps keep you sane through all of this? Uh, yeah, uh, I, I have conversations with with my with my boss, with my AD, because um, we all know that this this profession um, there there is a there can be burnout. There's a lot of burnout. I've talked to colleagues who 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 work so much that they're that they just don't enjoy it anymore. Um, so I talked to my boss about maybe if we have an off day, 
a rare off day. I will ask my my athletic director, hey, can I take this Wednesday off? Can I take this uh, this Monday off? Uh, and for the most part, he, he's pretty understanding because he sees uh, what we do, how busy we are in in uh, in our daily uh, tasks, whether it's a regular day in the office from eight to four, eight to five, or if we have a game day uh, where we're, we're staying here until 10 o'clock at night uh, with game mops and doing recaps and so forth. Um, if we do have a game that's at night, uh, I will tell my boss, hey, I've, I'd like to come in a little later, uh, come in noon the next day. Um, and like, like like Alicia, I I when I have downtime, I try not to think too much about the job, and I just go out and I don't even watch sports. Um, I will watch some some horrible television. Uh, I'll I'll put on a a cartoon and and just and just kind of uh, drift off and not worry about anything. Or uh, during a during a day at the office, uh, I will step out. I will actually go out for walks on our campus. Uh, I will go and visit other departments just to say hello. So I'll, I'll go over to the registration registrar's office just to say hello. I'll go to the uh, president's office. I'll, I'll talk to the secretary there uh, and just kind of get away from athletics. And I find that to be really refreshing and it kind of resets my brain, uh, especially from the morning, uh, from lunchtime to the afternoon. So when I, when I, do need that kind of a, a stress relief. I'll I'll step out of the office on a, on normal work days. It helps me out a lot. Nice. No, you brought up a great point um, that I want to go a little bit deeper on in terms of talking to your supervisor. And in the Q and A uh, function, we got a great question here. Um, says I'm a GA in an office with several full timers. Everyone is pulled in many directions. And I have a really hard time pinning my supervisor down to go over issues. How do I best communicate with them? What do you like to see from your staff in communicating? Kevin, if you can break down a little bit of that since you brought up speaking with your uh, supervisor. Yeah, absolutely. So I I will always want to have a face to face with my with my AD. Uh, he is busy, but there's going to be times where he will need the downtime as well. And then that's all I'll. I'll ask him, hey, can we have this conversation? You know, I've I've done, I've worked for whatever, five days straight, including Saturday and Sunday. Uh, we have a couple of days off coming up. Can I can I take this, uh, just take tomorrow off or something like that? Or I, can I take next Tuesday off? Uh, try to have conversations with them. Uh, if he's out of the office, the, the wonderful thing about, about uh, sticky pads is that you write something, Put it on his door and that'll get his attention because if you walk in and that sticky pad is gone you know he's got it um just hope that he reads it but uh i, I just have that conversation with with your boss don't be don't be afraid to engage um for the most part they they are pretty understanding as to uh, what we do here in, in uh, athletic communications so don't be afraid have those conversations you, you'll, you'll find that they're probably more understanding that than uh, sometimes you think and if I may chime in uh, real quickly, when it comes to, you know, the supervisor, you know, having, you know, a lot of pulled in a lot of different directions and stuff like that. Um, one thing that I have found that works and ideally is best to do at the beginning of a semester than within the semester, I like to go and ask to have a standing meeting, you know, so then that way we can say, hey, the first Tuesday of the month or the third Wednesday of the month, you know, can we mark down and have a meeting? And when, you know, we could agree, agree on whatever time and whatever that day is and then put it in the calendar. So then we'll always get the reminders, you know, 15 or so minutes before that we have a meeting coming up. If people check their calendars, then, you know, you're able to say, hey, I have something going on. Can we push it to this time or can we reschedule? But if you can go in there and try to establish a um, standing meeting, I think that works good. And you can always phrase that in a sense of, you know, hey, I really, you know, 
want to progress in this field. I really want to focus in on professional development. I think I can learn a lot from you. Is it okay if we set up a standing meeting that we can have throughout the semester? And, you know, I mean, I would, I would anticipate that that would be a hard thing for somebody to just be like, no, you're not going to do that, you know? So uh, that's a little bit of a practical thing that maybe you can try as well. And doing that, leading, coming back from the holidays, it's a great time to really try to start that. And I, Keontae, I would add to that as well. That's an excellent point. I, I agree this. I agree wholeheartedly. Uh, I've got a standing with my boss, who's the AD, but among my staff, and I've had GAs also, and certainly student interns, um, I'm thrilled if they want to meet with me because again, that means they care enough to to want to, you know, be organized and and find out what expectations I have for them and and learn more about what's happening because there's so many things we all get spread into our own areas and many times I'm doing a lot of different things that they're probably not aware of and and unless they ask and if they show that interest then then I will share with them and that can help you know, them understand about maybe what the next step is or the next couple of steps in their development. But I will say, because we all are so busy and, and I have, I don't know, probably at least a meeting or two every single day, and we all kind of get meeting out a little bit. What helps is um, if you come into that meeting with an agenda and you share that beforehand. And my, I've got an assistant who's been with me for 23 years and he is fabulous at doing this. He'll send me a note the day before and say, I, I know we said we're going to meet tomorrow at 10 o'clock. Here are the items I'd like to go over. And, and so I can get a glance at it and and formulate some thoughts as well. So we can just be more efficient at the meeting. Because again, we've all been a part of meetings that kind of just go around and they tend to drag and people lose interest and so on. And so it's one thing if you're having a casual meeting, just talking about goals and things, which is great. And those can be impromptu or scheduled. But if you have something you really want to get at with your boss, um, get an agenda built, at least a couple bullet points where you can share and just say, hey, these are the things I'd really like to talk to you about. And then if there's anything you want to add to that, that's great, too. It just keeps everybody on point and keeps it moving along a little. Yeah. No, those are uh, some great tips as well. Um, great question as well. So, again, continue to use that Q&A um, function. Uh, those are some great questions. Um, so I mentioned that we still have one more layer deep to go when it comes to this crossover season. And um, this is probably one of the bigger ones. So, you know, Alicia, let's say, what about postseason? You know, um, if you have a team that is going to the postseason, how do you handle those responsibilities? Are you going with the team? Do you stay home? Um, just talk a little bit about that. So we're in a unique spot here at LC State. We host um, an opening round for baseball. We also host the national championship. So um, our entire month of May is pretty much nothing but baseball. So that's when I really have to remind myself to keep things balanced. And yes, baseball is, you know, getting into postseason. It's essentially another crossover season at that point. You have um, the regular season for other sports still wrapping up and postseason can even feel like a whole other season. You still have track and field competing. You can still have tennis and golf competing. Um, and it's, it comes back to what we talked about before, with prioritizing. Um, if a team is in the postseason, they are going to take priority, um, regardless of the round. You know, if it's a conference tournament, an opening round, a final site, that team made it to the postseason, so you're going to give them the attention they deserve. But also still you know, leaning on others to make sure other sports get covered. Uh, I'm lucky I get to travel. I've traveled the last couple of years when we do have teams go elsewhere. I've traveled with women's basketball, men's basketball. Um, if schedules allow, that's, that kind of is the biggest thing mm -hmm. we it's worked out the last couple of years where we haven't had home events, but if we do have home events and this has happened too, or, you know, we'll have home conference baseball at the same time, the basketball is in the postseason, So that becomes a balancing act. Like if I'm not able to be a baseball, can baseball still run? And typically that one's a yes. Uh, but if it is a bigger weekend, then we kind of weigh the options say, okay, we're going to worry about baseball here at home. And if basketball progresses, wins a couple games and gets further into the tournament, that's when we're going to look at traveling. Because the nice thing with the, with the postseason is you don't have to, it's long. You don't have to be there right at the start of it. You know, if your team advances to a national title game, then, you know, you talk to your AD and say, hey, can we get on a flight and get over there? But it also becomes a budget issue, obviously, talking to the AD and knowing if you have the funding to get there and also being okay with not necessarily being there because, the nice thing with, for the most part, live streams, live stats, and having 
you know, maybe a coach who's going to help you get video or something, leaning on them, but learning how to cover those sports if you can't be there is also really important. Nice. And um, Kevin, how about you? Yeah, I think you're in the midst of a, a tournament run right now, right, for volleyball? Yeah, uh, we had our, our volleyball uh, regionals was uh, last week. Unfortunately, we didn't make it to the nationals, uh, which start tomorrow. Uh, I, I'm okay with that. Um, in that instance, if our volleyball team did make it, I, I would have traveled because we don't have uh, any home events. Now, if if we're in the middle of a, of a starting a postseason, but we have home events um, that that require me to be there or to have some kind of uh, operations management, then I will not travel because the home events at, for us will take precedence or will have priority rather um, over teams that are traveling uh, for, for postseason. But uh, in the past, we I've been lucky a couple of times where I will travel with teams to uh, to basketball conference tournament because we don't have any spring home events going on. Uh, I've had situations where we've had smaller sports uh, play, uh, but because the, like golf and tennis, those don't, for us, um, does not require any home event management. Uh, every Those teams kind of uh, take care of themselves and I usually will travel, but I don't, will not ignore them. Uh, I, I make sure I tell those coaches, hey, I'm traveling. Uh, give me uh, results, any scores and so forth. And then uh, while I'm gone, I'll, I'll go ahead and take care of that. So like uh, tennis, for example, is, is the big one for us. Um, so I'll go ahead and, and I'll take care of tennis files while I'm on the road. It's, it's pretty simple enough. I just get the, the scorebook or got to get a photo of the scorebook and, uh, and uh, input them into my stat crew computer. Uh, while I'm gone but uh, yeah it's it's it just depends for us whether we have home events that would conflict with the with traveling on postseason yeah so <clears throat> I want to ask you uh, this question John uh, we're going to flip it a little bit um, and it'll be really our last question before we start answering anything on the Q&A so if you have any questions you still got time throw them in the chat I mean in the Q&A uh, function and we'll get to them. Um, but John, kind of flipping that, we kind of spoke about if you travel with the team, how would you handle back home stuff? Usually the cases is probably not at home stuff, things like that. But what if in the context of postseason, what if you have to stay home, but you have a team that's in the postseason going on a run for a championship. How do you go about handling the road stuff? Yeah, these are all really interesting questions because they they depend on so many factors. And, and as Kevin alluded to many times, that the your staffing and the circumstances make the decision for you, or your boss, the AD, has a firm opinion on something, and then the decision is made whether you go or not. Um, I had an interesting one this fall where, again, my team, the women's soccer team, was the regular season champions. They were hosting at least the semifinal as the top seed, and had they gotten through that, uh, they would have hosted the championship. Um, I think a day after the semifinal, I would have normally been hopping on a plane with men's basketball for their season opener at Northwestern. Um, I, I was uncomfortable not being here for what could have been a championship game that we were hosting. And then a selection show event that we typically make a big fuss about with our community and, and campus. And so even though men's basketball was our number one sport at Binghamton, um, and this was a season opener, a money game at a prominent school, um, I had to make the early decision because of the plane tickets to, you know, send my assistant there and stay home for what ended up being a semifinal loss, of course. And then the calendar opens up uh, quite a bit, unfortunately. I, we've all been in this position where you're rooting so hard for your teams and then they lose and then you try to convince yourself, well, maybe it's for the better. Anyway, I, I can get these other things done or I get a few moments by myself. Um but anyway, the travel situation, I think, is just very interesting. If you can't travel, sometimes I feel like we can be, well, most of the time, I feel like we can be more effective just in the central, you know, at my kitchen table, monitoring a, a game and, and handling social media, and especially if we have a freelance person there taking video or photos or we're getting something from the other school. It's amazing how efficient you can be enough to the point where 
at our level, I think many of us in our conference sort of asked the question quietly, why are we traveling with basketball during the regular season when we can be so much more efficient at home, especially if there's not a huge media crush? Um, same thing postseason. I mean, if there's not a huge media obligation, especially for for us, it's really all about contingency plans. I mean, if there's a quarterfinal or a semifinal game, and I know if we win, obviously a bigger game is happening later, then I can hold off on traveling because the big game is is upcoming. And, and we kind of worry about what that's going to look like. And, and like all SID, so many plans we make end up being irrelevant, but you have to plan for them um, and, and think these things through well in advance. So I think a lot of it really depends on it also depends on your skill set too, and your. We like to. I like to have the person who's covered the sport the whole season, be the one with them in a perfect world. But having said that, there might be someone on our staff who uh, is more valuable on the road. Um, I, I'm the old school SID where I'll write and deal with the media. I'm not great with social media, and so I understand that in a moment of a championship being won, if there's a choice between me. And one of my younger assistants, who's a whiz with video and, and social media, we'd probably rather have that person if we had to just send one. Um, if there's a media crush and there's going to be a lot of other prep things with with national media and so on, then maybe I'm that person. But so a lot of it is really kind of examining your staff and your own skill set. Um, but much of it, honestly, is just dictated by what's possible and and also the priority that hopefully has been expressed to you by your boss with some of your input, too. So. It, it, unfortunately, I think my short answer to this long answer is everything is different. You got to just work it out by the sport, by the season and, and at your school, depending on your circumstances. Yeah. And <clears throat> real quick, I would say, uh, Alicia, what about some of your thoughts as far as on that same scenario? You know, how do you cover things postseason if you're if you're at home, but they're on the road? You know, similar to what John kind of mentioned, sometimes it actually is easier to cover an away event from home. You're not worried about Wi-Fi. We, I've been in national championships either. You know, it's cross country and there is no Wi-Fi or you're in a facility that the Wi-Fi isn't great. So you're getting stuff up slower than you actually would like to than you normally would back home. And you don't always have access to your graphics templates or something's not loading. I was at cross country and my graphic templates would not load. So my All-American graphics were late and that really bothered me. But I, you know, knowing if I'm back home, I'm able to fully watch the game. It's a lot easier to get a hold of people because you're not worried about trying to find someone in a locker room. You have everything you need at your fingertips. So you're able to, you can't get, you know, those emotional videos like John was talking about. You don't always have that person right there on the sidelines who's going to get the video of a winning goal or a buzzer beater or something like that but you're still able to do it justice, maybe a little bit differently than you'd like, but you're still still able to do it justice from home with yeah. reliable internet. Good, good, good. Um, so what I want to do now is really go and talk about our final question that we have in the Q&A that um, I will probably at some point have all three answer. Um, but this is going all the way back to John, what you said can be our own separate webinar. Um, so we have one more question that came in and it asks, um, uh, how do you handle a uh, out of season sport coach who wants higher level of coverage? So oh, I'm sorry, uh, that was supposed to be for you, John starting out. I'm sorry. Out of season coach who wants wants more or a higher standard of of coverage. Um, <laughs> um, it is a delicate scenario as as I talked about before. Um, if it's a reasonable request and something that either you have the wherewithal or or a student, but it's just a, a matter of time, then maybe you can accommodate, but just at at a slower time pace. So if they want something next week, you can't do it. But the other thing too is, again, part of this education thing, especially that we're all kind of getting more into video coverage. For me as a non-video person 10 years ago, um, I had a hard time determining what an appropriate time span should be for someone to create a hype video or a highlight package, a minute highlight video or something for social media because I hadn't done it myself. I didn't know what was reasonable to expect, you know, 
three hours, three days, three weeks. Uh, and so part of it is educate and the coach doesn't know either since they don't do that typically. So part of it is just sort of explaining number one, here's what's involved and in, in what you're looking for. And usually, I don't know if this is the case with the question, but in our case, many of our coaches will see something that another school is doing. And that's sort of our worst nightmare, isn't it, everybody? Uh, and they will send it to you and say, well, can't we do this? And so for us, it might be some incredible Instagram video for you know Clemson soccer, men's soccer, in which you know Clemson, among other big bigger schools have exceptional video uh and, and so many staffers and interns to do that so part of it again is just um trying to explain in the most patient understanding way you don't have the wherewithal to do that but you'll you like the idea and maybe you can work toward that it's just going to be at a slower pace um and truthfully, if you're really talking about a conflict where someone's asking for something unreasonable, and this has happened at Binghamton in, in my 33 years, it's probably happened, I don't know, five or six times where we've been at, at an impasse and not been able to sort it out. And we've I've requested since I felt comfortable about the support I was getting from my boss at the time, I requested a sit down with the coach, myself, and both of our bosses who, you know, the AD in theory oversees everyone. And... And so that the coach hopefully can hear something from the boss that says, listen, uh, unfortunately, this is unreasonable. This request is unreasonable. And here's why, uh, because you've educated them about how, how difficult it is. So I know it's not a great answer, uh, but sometimes there is an impasse that just can't be solved. And you hope that you will both be professional about it. But if it gets a little testy, um, you have to escalate it at that point because it's just unrealistic. But if it's something that's that you agree with, that would be great. And you think you have the staff yourself or someone else that can maybe do it. Um, you can give it a shot, meet, meet part way, which is either on a slower deadline or something to a little lesser degree. Um, again, it's just these constant compromises, but hopefully the communication is at least always um, cordial and professional as, as it should be. And they have to be willing to understand what you do. I'll add one small little caveat that shows where coaches are. Um, and we all know this, but it struck me as funny. So postseason last year, I was traveling with our men's basketball team. We're at a uh, quarterfinal game at UMBC in Baltimore. And as luck would have it, I guess, um, there was a power outage in the area, not even on campus, but across the area. And so the game was delayed, I think five hours. And during this delay, it was dark in the in the gym, in the arena, but not too dark. And so I was actually following our baseball team, which is one of my sports in the spring. So this was, I think, the first week in March. And I was live clipping some baseball highlights from this game that we played, I think, at Norfolk State. And the coaches and players, basketball players were just sitting around and I was at press row and, and doing my thing with baseball and enjoying the fact that I could actually keep up with this other sport now, talk about overlap. And so I posted, I think we hit a grand slam or something and I tweeted it and, and posted it. And one of our basketball coaches a minute or two later turned around at the table and said to me, John, unbelievable. I just saw that our, our baseball team hit a grand slam. We're up for nothing on, on Norfolk state. And I had to say to him, I know I, I just posted that I, you're seeing what I just posted a minute ago. But my point is, Coaches can only see what, what's in front of them. That's all they care about. And it's that's what they're paid for. It's not, I'm not, I'm not trying to bust on them, but the point is they never fully understand what you've got going. And so it kind of is this constant reminder of all the things you have and just to temper their expectations as much as possible. But if if you can't, then you have to escalate it and hope you got the support of your boss. Yeah. And what about you, Alicia, <clears throat> excuse me, um, handling out of season sport who wants a higher level of coverage? You know, echoing what John said, having you know the backup from your admin, from your AD, if things do escalate to that level, but also, you know, empower your coaches to, you know, if say they want some type of video project, if I don't have time, if I don't have the intern power to do it look elsewhere. We have coaches who have friends that are in the video production field. Um, you know, they want this certain set of photos for a scrimmage they're going to have out of season. Look into hiring you know, an outside photographer. If it's in your budget and you want it that badly and that quickly, there's ways to make it happen with people in the area who can help out with things like that as well. All right. Well, I would like to say that was some great feedback on that again thank you for that question 
Um, and we're coming up on our time. So first, we'd like to say thank you to all of our presenters giving us their insight on how to handle the overlapping season. And uh, we also want to thank you. Thank you for sending in your questions. Thank you for being here and taking the time to invest in yourself. Uh, it's a really big deal and it's very important. Um, and again, this webinar is recorded and it will be available on the CSC website. That is, the website is collegesportscommunicators.com. And um, feel free to rewatch this once it's made available, share it with your colleagues, um, take notes on it. Um, it'll be something that is definitely beneficial. You might think of something or hear something that you may have missed this first time. Um, <clears throat> finally, encourage you to go and spend some time on the CSC website, just in general. Um, and then you can really find out a lot of updated information that we have coming up, whether that's CSC programming or other continuing education opportunities. So again, thank you all for being here tonight. Great, uh, great conversation. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again later. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, everyone.